Good evening and welcome back once again to Channel 514, where, after a long hiatus, we are continuing with our series Exploring Ancient Literature. Now, where we left off, we had been discussing the Iliad and Odyssey, the two great Homeric epics, and I had promised to continue along this track by describing what are known as the Homeric hymns. And so that is where I'd like to pick up our discussion this evening, and afterward there is another volume I'd like to discuss that includes a lot of fragments of other early Greek epic literature. So for the Homeric hymns, we'll be using this 1970 translation by poet Charles Boer, and I'll also point out that there is another, well, there's a much more famous translation by the uh, Renaissance scholar George Chapman. Chapman's Homer, of course, is his famous translation of the Iliad and Odyssey, and he also got around to the Homeric hymns at some point in his career, and this would have been in the early 17th century, so beginning actually in 1598 and then into the 1610s and perhaps a bit later. So. Anyway, the Homeric hymns, what are they? Are they a series of hymns to the Greek gods written by Homer? Well, no, they're not, but they are a series of poems written over a long period of time and eventually compiled under the heading Homeric hymns, written in dactylic hexameter, the poetic meter used by Homer or used in the two Homeric epics, and they are written in the form of hymns to the Greek gods, although in most cases I don't think we know that they were actually used in that context. So let's just quickly read one of the shorter hymns just to give ourselves a sense of how they sound, and I think you'll understand even without going into dactylic hexameter, which um, I don't think is used here in a, in a really strict way. Anyway, I think then you'll understand what is Homeric about them. So here is a hymn to Athena that goes like this, and it's not the only hymn to Athena found in here, but I believe there are two. There are at least two. Well, anyway, here's the hymn to Athena, quote, I'll start this singing with that grand goddess Pallas Athena, bright eyes so shrewd, her heart inexorable, as virgin redoubtable, protectress of cities, powerful, Tritogene, whom shrewd Zeus himself produced out of his sacred head, bedecked in that spangly gold war armor she wears. What awe enthralled all those immortals who saw her jump suddenly out of his sacred head, shaking her sharp spear right out of Zeus who holds the Aegis. Great Olympos itself shook terribly under the might of bright eyes. The earth groaned awfully, and the ocean was moved to foam up with dark waves. Then, as sudden, the salt sea stopped. The glorious son of Hyperion, the sun, stood his fast-footed horses still for a long time until the girl took that godlike armor from her immortal shoulders. Shrewd Zeus laughed. And so, greetings to you, daughter of Zeus, who holds the Aegis. I will remember you in another song. So there are a few things in here that you'll notice that are characteristic of this literature, the Homeric hymns. One of these is that the god or goddess is called by a lot of epithets, which is often the case with Homeric characters. And another is that well-known myths or stories about the gods or traditions about the gods which to us are well known and are mainstays or standard fare of what we know today as Greek mythology, these canonical stories, so to speak, are recalled in here and sometimes even described or retold in detail and at length. So in this case, we don't uh, we don't see our poet going into much detail, but we do see this story being retold about Athena springing fully formed and fully armed from the head of Zeus. 
So we don't find out all about how she got into his head, why she came into being in there, and and how that fits into the cycle of stories about Zeus, the king of the gods. But we do see her springing from his head, and so that well-known story is recalled here. Now in other cases, such as A Hymn to Hermes, which is in here somewhere, or also the hymn to Daly and Apollo, and in, and in some others in here, you find some of these canonical stories retold in great detail, and in fact, these poems in particular are our major sources for these stories. So that's not true of every story you've ever heard about the Greek gods, or the mortals with whom they interacted, such as uh, Arachne or Niobe or someone like that, but these are some of the really well-known stories, and in, in some cases this is where we find them, and this is how they've come down to us, really. So, in the hymn to Daly and Apollo, and the hymn to Pythia and Apollo, we find out about how, for example, the mother of the twins, Apollo and Artemis, was pursued by a monster and ultimately was only able to give birth on the island of Delos, and how her son Apollo then avenged her by killing the monster and establishing the site of Delphi as his own oracle, whereas it had previously been an oracle of the earth. And so that's an example of how you find these canonical stories in the, Apollo, in the uh, Homeric hymns. Another example would be the story about the god Hermes, the messenger of the gods, being born in a cave where his mother, a titaness, had taken refuge and uh, had gone into labor. And so Hermes is born there in the cave, and being a sort of mischievous character, he goes and steals a herd of cattle belonging to Apollo. And he uses different stratagems or different devices to make sure that no one will be able to track him to the cave where he's hidden the cattle. But nonetheless, Apollo is able to find him and demand justice from the gods. And so we find, there, we find there this famous scene of Apollo pursuing the infant Hermes into the, the courtroom of Mount Olympus and demanding justice from his fellow gods. And so we know, of course, that Hermes himself is then inducted into the number of the gods, or he becomes one of the Olympians. But Anyway, so that's just, those are just a few examples of the importance of the Homeric hymns. And, oh, another, of course, would be the story about the wanderings of Demeter and how her daughter Persephone was taken to the underworld by Hades, the god of the underworld, etc. And you've probably heard that story, or you're probably somewhat familiar with it, so I won't just retell it in detail here, but... Anyway, that's another example of something you find in the Homeric hymns. And so, that is the first thing that I wanted to talk about in this video. So now you've seen, we've seen, how there's a little more than just the two epics to what is known as the Homeric literature. And, let's see about this volume of Chapman's Homeric Hymns, there may be something in here that I'd also like to point out. Well, Chapman includes a series of Homeric Apocrypha, so to speak, which he calls Certain Epigrams and Other Poems of Homer. And this is really just a, a miscellaneous collection of things. I guess I could read one just to just to see how we like it, so to speak. Here's one, page 185, to certain fisher boys pleasing him with ingenious riddles. So, I'm not sure I've ever even read that myself. 
and it's only four lines long, so that's perfectly suited to, to this occasion. Quote, Yet from the bloods even of your self-like sires are you descended, that could make ye heirs to no huge hordes of koine, nor le of coin, not koine like koine Greek. Let's just start that all over again, because that was a terrible blunder that I just made. Yet, from the bloods even of your self-like sires are you descended, that could make ye heirs to no huge hordes of coin, nor leave ye able to feed flocks of innumerable rabble. So for some reason, I guess uh, Homer, or whoever it is, is saying that although these fisher boys have pleased him with their ingenious riddles, they are still descended from sires just like themselves, from fishermen, that is, who are not going to make them heirs to a lot of money or leave them able to feed flocks of innumerable rabble. So I don't know if he means sheep or children when he says innumerable rabble there, but anyway, there you have it. Some Homeric Apocrypha. Now, so let's ask another question. Are there other early Greek epics beside the Homeric ones? And of course, you know I'm going to tell you that yes, there are. And in the famous Loeb Classical Library, I don't have too many of them myself, they're quite pricey, but here's this volume, Greek Epic Fragments, and it includes a lot of these fragments dating from the 7th to the 5th centuries BC. So dating to what is known as the Archaic period in Greek history, which is generally thought of as being pretty much the, uh, well, the 9th, 8th, 7th, and 6th centuries BC, down to about 4, 480 BC, when the classical period begins. And so there are different cycles of these lost epics, and the reason we have fragments of them still extant is that they're either quoted in other authors or they're referred to by other authors. So in the case of some of them, we actually have fragments of them extant, and in the case of others, we only know that they existed. But anyway, what they're about generally is different cycles of heroic mythology, basically. So they tend to be about mortal heroes more than about the adventures of the gods. And so you might find things like the story of the Trojan War. There's a cycle of stories about the of, uh, epics. There was a cycle of epics dealing with stories and, and traditions about the Trojan War. Another example would be the so-called Theban cycle, which had to do with the story of the royal house of the city-state of Thebes in Boeotia in central Greece. So, of course, that's where we get the story of Oedipus and Antigone and the seven against Thebes and the so-called Epigone, the sons of the seven, etc., from these Theban epics. And they're listed here in the table of contents as an Oedipodea, a Thebaid, Epigone, and Alcmaeonis, but that's one example. There's also, there were also some on Heracles or Hercules and Theseus, the uh, legendary king of Athens, and there are also some that have to do with the histories of particular places or regions in Greece. So, for example, the uh, the poet Eumelos, or Eumelos, he is known to have written one epic known as Titanomachia, which would be which would mean battle with the Titans. So this would have had to do with the struggle between the gods and their the Olympian gods, that is, and their forebears, the Titans who were a more primitive race of gods in, in classical myth. Now, Eumelus is also credited with something called the Corinthiaca, so an epic dealing with the legendary early history of the city-state of Corinth in the Isthmus, of course, that connects mainland Greece with what is known as the Peloponnese. And so 
These are examples of some of the earlier Greek epics. And of course I mentioned a Trojan cycle. Let's see if there's anything else that I'd like to mention before we wrap this up. Well, we also have a section of unplaced fragments in here, mostly ascribed to Homer. Homer is in quotes. But anyway, I think I've, I think I've made the point that I wanted to make, really. So in addition to the two Homeric epics, which deal largely with traditions about the heroes associated with the semi-legendary sack of the city of Troy, and also with various tales of the Olympian gods. We also have various other epics from the Archaic period that deal with the history of parts of Greece, with heroic mythology, with tales of the gods, and with other sort of antiquarian or, or legendary or mythological matter. So anyway, I think that's about long enough for this video. It's I meant for it to be a, a minor one. But we have carried our series exploring ancient literature just a little bit farther in this one. So in our next installment in this series, I think I'll move on to the poet Hesiod. And if you haven't heard of him, well, let's just say that he had quite a few important works to his credit, and one of these, which is usually attributed to him, is another of these major sources for much of what we know today as canonical classical mythology. And another of them is an important account, or an important reflection, or panorama, so to speak, of rural life and peasant life or that sort of thing in the Archaic period. And so that's about where I'd like to leave this. So next stop will be the works of Hesiod. And thanks for joining me once again in our series Exploring Ancient Literature. And I will be seeing you soon, so take care.